Hi, good morning. Um, welcome. Um, Happy New Year. I'm Lydia Santiago. I'm a member of the Ground Rounds Committee and a Diversity Committee. And I'd like to um, introduce um, Dr. Kurt Organista, who's a professor at UC Berkeley uh, in the Department of Social, uh, Social Welfare. And he's going to be, his area of expertise is um, Latino mental health and HIV prevention. And uh, we want to welcome him today, this morning, to, for our, our first um, 2019 uh, talk. So what I wanted to say is that this is the title of my uh, talk uh, back here. And if you notice, I kind of, I sort of color coded it a little bit so that I could highlight uh, three parts of that title. One, the population that I've been working with lately, those are Latino migrant day laborers. You, you guys have probably seen these men out on the corner of Mission and Cesar Chavez uh, hoping to get a, a day's work or maybe in front of paint shops or uh, hardware stores. Uh, and the problem that I'm looking at here is problem drinking and uh, HIV risk, which sometimes go together. And I'm trying to look at it from, as you see up there, a, a structural environmental approach, which means that I'm trying to be mindful of the very uh, sometimes complicated context in which uh, health problems uh, happen, health disparities uh, in which we're interested in how those health disparities affect certain populations. Uh, a lot of the thinking that came from the study I'm going to be sharing with you today is from a book that I, I published back in 2012 that simply tried to look at HIV prevention in Latino communities from research and practice perspectives. So let me begin by uh, introducing you to, uh, we'll call him uh, Agustin. Uh, he's one of 125,000 day laborers that we often see in large cities, mid-sized cities looking for work. Uh, we, uh, in this project, uh, in trying to understand problem drinking and HIV risk, we spent uh, a lot of time doing a very up-close ethnography uh, with day laborers in San Francisco. So, for example, we did 51 very uh, in-depth, long interviews with day laborers just to see what their experience was like. And what is it like to be a day laborer? What are, the, what are some of the good things about that? What are, what are some of the not so good things about that? We even touched on the idea of something that would be interesting to all of you. What, what's an ideal life? What, what is an ideal life for you? And as you can see here, Augustine uh, had a response to that question that, uh, that I think is, is kind of universal in some ways. I think that all of us can relate to that in some, to some degree. This person, uh, Juanito, uh, also uh, talked about the importance of family, but uh, he, uh, he highlighted a contradiction. The contradiction being that while on the one hand, family is the most important thing to him, he can't be with his family to support him. He has to be hundreds and thousands of miles away. So he says, so I'm just going to focus on money then. I'll, my life will just be about focusing on money. That's it. Sadly, that's not a, that's not a great uh, thing to focus solely on because these are guys who are lucky to make $200 a week. Could you imagine being a, apart from your partner for 11 years? Think about that. Could you imagine that if you had a long-term partner? And then to top it off, not having the, the work that you came to uh, try and support that family. This guy that we will call Lacero, he uses a word called des desperation. And in, and in Spanish, it's desesperación. I'm going to talk more about that because it comes up a lot. But he, he uses the word to describe a predicament where, on the one hand, he needs to stay here long enough to make enough money to take back home. On the other hand, if he stays too long, he may become estranged from his family. He may lose his family. And it actually happens fairly frequently. 
I told my girlfriend I was going away for some time. I told her that I loved her and wanted to marry her, but that I wanted to come to this country to do something like build a house, buy a car, have a fully furnished house, you know, to have our children. Then I told her that if she loved me, that she would wait for me, and I was going to be here for three or four years until I could go back to Guatemala. How do you guys think this love story ends? Any guesses? Come on. It's not that early. What? <laughs> he does? <laughs> she told me she really loved, and loved me and adored me, so I came over here within a year and a half, cheated on me, and found another boyfriend. This was two years after the breakup. He was still very upset about it. Drinking is something huge because it ruins you. First, your health. Secondly, your family. It destroys your family. Third, your job. No one believes in you in any, anymore. No one will give you a job anymore. Why? Because of your bad appearance. Two months ago, I had unprotected sex. There were three of us, other friends who were from over there, from Mexico. Well, we were drinking and we got a bit drunk. My friends told me to go over there walking. Over there, over there on 22nd Street around there, they told me they knew a girl and let's go visit her, they told me. And we went. And no, we didn't find the girl, but since it was late, we found another girl there on the street. We talked to her, got her in the car, and well, obviously we gave her money, and yeah, the girl wanted to, but we didn't have protection. No, well, the girl wanted to. She, uh, she didn't refuse anything. So these are the voices of some of the men that we interviewed. We spent about a year and a half making sure to interview uh, older guys, younger guys, people from Central America, Mexico, people who have been here a couple of years, people who have been here many years. So do these uh, voices of the men, do they start to help you understand how problem drinking, why it might occur, or how sexual risk taking might occur? I, I, I'm glad I see a, a head nodding, so I, I hope so, because that's the whole point of ethnography. You, know, you have some ideas or hunches about how things happen, and yet it's important to get up close and not be too presumptuous and, and talk to people, just talk to them about their lives. If you could build that trust if you're working through the right kinds of agencies, uh, for example. So <clears throat> for us, <clears throat> all this information was helpful because we were trying to think about problem drinking, HIV risk on multiple levels. Same, same thing of, with HIV prevention. You want to think about that on multiple levels. All of us know that when it comes to HIV risk, there are biomedical factors involved. There are behavioral risk factors involved. We know that pretty well because we've spent most of our time looking just at those things. Sometimes we don't look enough at some of the situational risk factors. What are some of the situations that certain people have to face frequently that are really risky situations? And how do some of the contextual, structural, environmental factors create those risky situations over and over again? That's, that's what we were hoping to sort of fill in some of these different uh, problems. Uh, levels. Now this is not a particularly uh, complex slide, it's just a reminder that when we're interested in health disparities or how certain problems affect certain populations, it's worth the exercise of trying to just think about those multiple levels for a while. But it's actually a pretty, it's a pretty simple way of trying to, you know, trying to depict the world. In fact, uh, it's, it's simple, so simple that I actually thought about doing one of those books, you know, and just kind of like writing it up one of those books that you, that you know and love. And of course, we would probably translate that into Spanish, right? So let's talk about some of those structural factors. Let's talk about some of those factors that might be related to risk, even though they seem so big and abstract and so far away. Uh, I would start, if I wanted to do HIV prevention with this group of people, I would start by trying to amend some of the structural causes of mass 
undocumented Latino migration to the U.S. And this is something that Barack Obama talked about way back in 2008 when he was running for president. He talked about the need to amend the North American Free Trade Agreement. He talked about the need to correct its many failures because while the U.S. was making lots of money off of the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, with Mexico. Hey, Ricardo. Uh, the, the, uh, Mexico was not making uh, very much money at all. Although this isn't a talk about NAFTA, it's, it's worth saying a couple things. Uh, first thing is that uh, free trade sounds like a good idea. You know, let's open up the borders for trade, at least. And uh, let's not, you know, charge taxes and things like that. Sounds like a good idea. But I think the, the thing to remember is that free trade is not fair trade. And so the U.S. has a lot of advantages in its free trade agreements with Mexico. It makes a lot of money. Mexico has been pretty flatlined economically since NAFTA was passed in, in 1994. I'll give you one example, one example of how NAFTA doesn't work that well for Mexico. Uh, some of you know that Mexico has always had a very thriving corn industry, right? Do we know that? Think about Mexican food. If you didn't have corn, you wouldn't have tacos and enchiladas and pozole. Just about everything is based on corn, right? In fact, that was the sort of gift to the world from that part of the world, corn. But it's now become cheaper to buy subsidized corn from the U.S. Uh, cheaper than, than hundreds, hundreds of thousands of small farmers can grow it. Cheaper, cheaper to import it and buy it than to grow it. So in the agricultural economy, uh, Mexico has lost about 2 million jobs in that sector because of NAFTA. It's disemployed about 2 million people. Where do you think those people go to find work? Any guesses? And uh, even though it was, it's been pretty unsuccessful for Mexico, we back in 2005, we actually passed another free trade agreement with Central America and the Dominican Republic. And we tried to get one going with all of South America, but all the leaders of the South American countries, they got together and said, you know what, <laughs> we don't think that's working very well. We, saw what it, we see what it's doing in Mexico, we see what it's doing in the Dominican Republic and Central America, we don't we don't want any part of it. So they actually they actually bowed out of that, and probably are smart uh, for doing that. So we have to amend some of those neoliberal economic causes of mass Latino Latina migration, because in in some indirect way they result in the day labor population here, a predominantly undocumented population of workers. I would also say that we need to challenge and change racist, racist narratives in America. I don't need to tell you that it's a hostile environment now for uh, migrants. Uh, a lot of racist uh, rhetoric being spewed. In Arizona, we have, we have AB 1070. That's a law that, that, uh, had, that, that allows uh, local law enforcement to do immigration control. And that's kind of a contaminated thing to do. You know, either you're going to protect the public and try to prevent crimes, uh, or you're going to do immigration control. It's hard to do both because the communities won't call you. If somebody is beaten or robbed or raped, they're not going to, they're not going to call you if you're going to police their documentation stat or their wives or their brothers or their neighbors or something like that. So these are huge structures. These are huge major structural factors that need to be considered uh, in, in thinking about the, the more proximal individual risk of day laborers right here in San Francisco. So with some of those structural factors in mind, or even superstructural factors in mind, I want to tell you about uh, a study that we uh, did. We uh, wrote a grant. We, we, uh, we said that we wanted to develop and test a structural environmental model of alcohol-related sexual HIV risk. We were lucky enough to get that, that study funded. And this is kind of how we were deconstructing uh, the problem for uh, NIAAA, who that were nice enough to 
fund the study. You guys know NIAAA, National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and uh, Alcohol Abuse and Addiction. Excuse me, Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. We simply said that those structural factors that we were talking about, they produce and they re reproduce certain environmental conditions for day laborers, which in turn create, produce, and reproduce certain individual psychological impacts. Those things together produce uh, situational conditions that are risky for day laborers and, and then produce and reproduce certain health outcomes. So what we did in this study is we tried to think about, well, we tried to fill in those boxes with the variables that seem to characterize those dimensions of the model. So, for example, if you were asked to ask me what is it like to be a day laborer in San Francisco, I'd say, well, these are people who are exposed to very harsh living and working conditions. They have to tolerate prolonged separation from home and family. They have to deal with stigma and discrimination. And so what kind of psychological impacts does that have on them? Well, certainly we would imagine that they would uh, feel some depression from time to time, maybe anxiety. But I kind of highlighted this term desesperación because whenever we talk to our, our day laborers, whenever we said, so, what, so when are you drinking more than you should? When are you taking risks that you probably wouldn't normally take? They would say, cuando estoy en la desesperación, o or cuando estoy desesperado. They wouldn't say when I'm anxious or when I'm depressed. Sometimes they would, but that came up so frequently that we that we really had to uh, ask about it and ask, well, what, what does that mean exactly? They'd say, you know, desesperación is like it's that it's that moment where you just you know things are going wrong. You're not making any money. You know, you you're missing your family, and you you just don't care anymore. So you just go out and drink. And if, you know, if a sexual opportunity comes up, maybe, maybe you, you partake of that. The other thing that is nice, the other thing that's nice about uh, sort of deconstructing the social cultural environment of day laborers and these problems they're interested in, is they also prime you for thinking about interventions at different levels. So, for example. At, at these structural levels, uh, we could really use some immigration reform. <laughs> if I could do one thing to prevent HIV and problem drinking and day laborers, I would say give these people some work authorization. If you gave them work authorization, they could get better jobs, they would have better living conditions, it would be less of this is but as shown, for example. And also at the community level, you know, uh, if we had more community and culture based resources, services that day laborers themselves consider culturally competent, know how to treat Latinos, help me solve my, my problems. Those, those would also be ways of intervening. And those also could be places where you could teach people coping resources for these states of mind. And finally, of course, you would want to work on situational resources and at, at the level of sexual risk, certainly help people with protective behaviors. All of, all of that makes sense. But I want to go back to desesperación for a second because it came, it came up so frequently that we just had to create a scale of that. So we were able to uh, uh, create this scale and uh, in order to um, test the model that you just saw, we, uh, it, we surveyed 350 migrant day laborers here in San Francisco and also in Berkeley. And we also wanted to see how the scale was working. Here are some of the items to give you an example of, well, what do, what do day laborers mean when they say desesperación? It's important to know because this is what they're talking about when they say, this is the, this is the state I'm in when I'm taking these risks. Um, how often do you feel frustrated about the lack of progress in your life? Uh, how often do you feel overwhelmed by uh, obstacles in your path? Those were the kind of, those were the kind of uh, items that we, uh, there was a, I think there was 12 or 13 items. We administered this to 350 people. We did all the fancy psychometri psychometrics to make sure it was a valid and reliable scale. And uh, we included that in the article we wrote so that people, people have access to that. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, one of the first analysis we did of that data 
with our sample of 350 day laborers here in San Francisco, also in Berkeley, by the way. Um, we wanted to see, well, these, these different psychological factors. We have depression and anxiety with which most of us are familiar here, but we also have this, this uh, culture bound syndrome, right? This Latino idiom of distress that we now have scaled uh, on a good working scale. So we wanted to see how those three, three things operated in a regression analysis to predict some of, the, some, some of the outcomes that we were interested in. And we were uh, surprised and maybe delighted in a way to see that when you put three, these three predictor factors into a regression analysis to predict some of these outcomes, that it wasn't depression or anxiety, but it was desesperación that predicted, that predicted alcohol-related sexual risks. So that's a very important factor. We were, uh, we were uh, surprised, I guess, in a way that, that this new scale would uh, operate so well in this model. We also found that depression, Ricardo, you would be interested in this, that these men do get depressed uh, with some frequency. That actually predicted substance-related sexual risk-taking. And here we're talking about things like crack cocaine or amphetamines, things that people mix with sex uh, on occasion. Uh, those, that kind of substance use didn't come up as much as alcohol use. Alcohol seems to be the substance of, cho of choice for this population. But it, but, it, but it comes up enough to be concerned about, and it certainly came up enough to be related to substance-related sexual risk taking. So given, given the support for this model I'm talking about, what would structural environmental HIV and problem drinking prevention look like? How might that happen on a more structural environmental level? Well, we, we noticed that one of our partners in West Berkeley is a Mexican priest there named Father Rigo, very loved by the community. He, he has the contract uh, with the city of Berkeley to sort of, uh, how would you put it, manage day laborers. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know Berkeley. The, do you know the Fourth Street shops are very, very nice, kind of, kind of upscale, you know, shops. And they, and they were saying, Father Rigo, we're going to give you the contract. You need to remove these people from that nice shopping area. And he said, I'll take the contract when I'm not removing anybody. I'm going to try to take care of these people. And so he does. He, uh, he does a brilliant thing. He uh, sponsors soccer games. He creates these soccer leagues, and they happen all year long. And there's even a championship at the end of the year. And these men, on Friday afternoons, do something healthy and recreational. And he gives them plenty to drink. No, no, no. So I'm talking about soda here. I'm talking about soft drinks. And, uh, you know, I would ask him about that one time. I said, this is a brilliant idea, a, a healthy recreational out outlet. And I noticed you do it on Fridays. What, what's up with that, Father Rigo? He said, well, you know, sometimes when these guys are desesperado, they, they, they binge drink on the weekend. So I want to interrupt that. I want to see if I can interrupt that. He says, brilliant. I said, you're like a structural environmental interventionist. He says, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just a poor Mexican priest trying to help my people. The other thing that they do there is they teach uh, vocational English classes. This is a hammer. This is how you negotiate a wage. If you know a little bit more English, particularly in the, in the world of work, you can do a little bit better economically, and that should, should help things. And we also try to experiment with giving people phone cards or trying to, trying to arrange some virtual family visits using Skype so that people could see their families back home? I mean, this is the reason why they're here, right? Sometimes these uh, men don't have the motivation to take care of their own health, but they will take care of their health for their families. So that, so if you can put them back in touch with their families, either with phone cards or Skype, we think, we think that's a good intervention. And sadly, when these guys are really drinking too much and really uh, psychologically distressed, that's when they stop calling home. That's when they stop writing home. They feel so bad that they're not sending money back home that they stop. And we say that's exactly when you need to be in touch uh, with your family. Some other structural environmental uh, prevention uh, methods. 
uh, political activism to combat some of the stigma and discrimination that we sort of hear constantly blaring out there. Uh, it's good to teach people about their rights as workers. You know, just because you're undocumented doesn't mean you can be abused and exploited. You have to be treated fairly, and some people need to be taught that. They're, they're, not, always, they're not always aware of that. Um, if we can improve basic housing, that's a big one, right? We can't even find housing for you guys <laughs> here in San Francisco, let alone day laborers. But there's been some experiments. There's a place called uh, Casa Quesada in the mission where they try to create some housing for day laborers who are so frequently marginally housed and some, sometimes uh, homeless. Um, you know, anything that would normalize the social, romantic, sexual relations of day laborers in the U.S. would be a good intervention. Uh, I got uh, interviewed uh, on a radio program a couple years back where they sort of asked me in almost a salacious way. They said, tell us, Dr. Organista, tell us how these day laborers take all of these sexual chances. And I said, well, tell me how you avoid taking those chances. What's going on? What's right about your life that's helping you to avoid those kinds of the, uh, risk, risk taking? So they never invited me back to that, that radio show, but I was trying to make the point that the more normal existence these folks could have, uh, the less risk that you would see in their lives from a structural environmental perspective. So let me just conclude here and say that um, we should promote more structural models of problem drinking, HIV prevention in Latino communities because comprehensive prevention and treatment is biomedical and behavioral, but it should also, it should also be situational and structural environmental in focus. And I can appreciate that that is very challenging to do, but what's that saying? Si se puede. Thank you. Okay, well, I've been talking for half an hour. Do you guys have any comments or questions you'd like to share? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. So I thought it was very interesting the way that you really tried to understand the nature of the Right. Their own subjective experience of that. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You mean like how did how did I go from a more individualized behavioral kind of way of thinking about it to something that's more contextual? That's that's what I'm sort of hearing. Not so much that, so much as like people expressed this disaster. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I can appreciate that. I can I can appreciate that. We can we can be very focused, very narrow sometimes in the way we uh, intervene with people. I know for myself, doing this research, it, it's it started off to be very much like that. We just we just want to know about behavioral risk. <laughs> what are the knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors? Call those CAB studies in HIV research, right? That that seem to add up to. Uh, HIV risk. But as we know, those those CAT studies, they, they sort of reached saturation. They kind of got played out and risk continues to happen. So it's so much more complicated. And I can appreciate that. What, what do you do here? I'm just a resident. Okay. Just, just a resident? <laughs> yeah, you know, I can appreciate that you, you, your time is limited, you know, but, uh, but hopefully there's some researcher types, you know, who are trying to suss this out, like you say. And for me, 
you know, the, the more we study this and the more diminishing returns that we saw in a behavioral model, in a behavioral risk model, you know, the more we wanted to back up and say, how do we think about the, the context of this? And so, of course, we, we read all the literature and we sort of came up with these theoretical ideas. And then, you know, you don't want to be too cocky, right? You want to go out and back up and just ask people about their lives. Tell me, tell me about your life. And when something, the beauty of ethnography is when something like desesperación keeps bubbling up, we got to go after it, right? And in, and in this case, we didn't, we didn't plan to scale it and validate a scale and publish a scale. We were more interested in what was predicting risk. But uh, we, we didn't feel like we had any alternative either. So it worked, it worked out pretty well. We were, we were happy to do that and, and to try to get that, that popular idiom of distress you know, published and available to people. So I don't know if that, that's a... And I was going to ask, like, are there comparable Well, you know, you, you can find good scales of depression and anxiety, alcohol use that have been well validated in Spanish-speaking populations, even even day laborers. We, we use the, the audit, I don't know if you know the audit, it's a very popular. Yeah, not that I know. Not that if, 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 if there had been, we would have just used that. <laughs> Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Do you want to say more about that? Yeah, one, one thought you're, you're making me think is we, we did compare the depression scale to the <clears throat> anxiety scale and the desesperación scale, and there was some overlap, but it did have a unique identity of its own. And I, I guess I would call it, it's sort of a scale of sort of angst, frustration, being overwhelmed, but particularly when goals are being thwarted. And that's not too dissimilar from depression but it was, it was unique enough to have its, its own identity. And it seems to have some predictive power. So. Was it different from the other guys, or was it more different? No, no, we had, we, we had a good sample size. We, we had a, a statistician doing a power calculation, <laughs> making sure that we had the, you know, a, a large, the power to uh, validate a scale like that. And uh, it was, it was uh, mostly a unique scale with very little, with a little bit of overlap with anxiety and depression, which we guessed that, that it would have, but it seems, seems to have some unique value. Of course, it's it's normed on day labor, so I would love people to take the scale and use it with other populations. With uh, some hands up over here, yes. Over. Oh, are you? okay. Okay, thank you. So did we learn anything about uh, access to health services for uh, day laborers? Yeah, we, we did. We, we uh, painstakingly asked them, what services have you used? You know, health, mental health, uh, uh, um, AA services for drinking. And, uh, and then we, we had a follow-up question, which was, when you use these services, uh, were they helpful? And, and, and when, if they were helpful, the, sm the sample gets smaller, right? <laughs> but when, when, when they were helpful, what, what was helpful about them? And people, so, so people had fairly good access to uh, health services here in San Francisco. You might imagine that's different than it would be in, in Arizona, you know, for example. But uh, they, they, uh, they did uh, tell us that they had 
fairly good access to health services. We actually worked with these day laborers through a number of agencies like, like the uh, Mission Neighborhood Health Resource Center, for example, which connects indigent people with the services that they need. And for them, uh, a culturally competent service was one that, of course, speaks Spanish, but it was also knows how to treat Latinos, uh, treats me with respect, doesn't keep me waiting. Waiting was a big deal because uh, some people wait uh, very long for services. And we actually, I'm glad you asked that question because we also did some analysis where we were looking at the relationship you know, uh, of things like difficult working and living conditions and mental health, as you saw here. And that factor, you know, people that had to use these services that they perceived to be culturally competent, mitigated that relationship. So that was also a, a very important finding. So those community-based health services with which some of you are, are involved, they do. They do seem to make a difference. Yes? I'm intrigued by the soccer. Oh, So am I aware of uh, uh, things like soccer leagues or you know healthy exercise programs that are that are linked to? Yeah, yeah. You, you know when when Father Rigo in West Berkeley uh, was doing that in Berkeley, he also does those in San Mateo. He's got another he's another community community uh, center there that also works with day laborers. I think, I think he knew intuitively that they needed some kind of healthy outlet like that. And let me tell you, these are well-attended soccer games. These people, I mean, what could be more culturally congruent, right, than these Latinos coming and playing uh, soccer with, you know, other, other teams and then building up to a championship at the end. Uh, just a brilliant idea. That's why I, I, would, I would tell Father Rigo about the things he was doing, and he would just kind of play it out. But I think intuitively he knew that. I don't, I don't know. You know, I mean, we know exercise is good for you, but I, I don't know about uh, any, any formalized uh, uh, teams or, you know, exercise programs like that. that, that the structural level, yeah. I, I don't think it's an exercise that the structural Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this, this is a brilliant idea, and it's, it just seems to work very well. Yes? Thanks, first of all, for this talk. It's excellent. And, uh, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I have sort of one quick comment and a question, but I can comment on this. Kind of going from the big picture evidence to personal experience, I, I, when I was president, I worked with the nation for several years at Citywide, one of our intensive management clinics, and he was a gentleman from uh, El Salvador. I documented very much in this situation working various jobs, and it was just Housing situations in and out of various um, job situations, and that was always the obvious predictor of how it was going to be doing it. So it's very much personal experience. So, so, so your intervention would be more housing, right? For and that's personal. Did, and that was actually the single most effective thing. Right. That's, that's, that's so structural, con yeah. concretely structural. Um, and so my question actually is a little bit of a different thing, but I'm wondering. So could you could you repeat the question? No, just I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so the so the question is about labor organizing and what what happens in that realm. Well, I, I, there are two things that come to mind. Uh, one, of, we had different community partners here in San Francisco to access and work with day laborers. 
Uh, one of them was, I believe, if I can remember it correctly, Delancey Street, and they're all about labor organizing, and they sort of take care of that aspect with day laborers in San Francisco. And I would also add that day labor centers are multi-purpose centers for day laborers. They do everything from organizing people so that everybody kind of gets their fair share of work to uh, going after employers who don't pay their uh, workers, sort of threatening them. They don't really have that much power, but they kind of threatening, threaten them with letters, you know. And so uh, they do, uh, some, some of that happens in, in the day labor centers where they do everything from providing breakfast to English. They're really kind of multi-purpose centers. Uh, and you can't do that in Arizona because, you know, day labor centers are like outlawed in, in a state like Arizona. But certainly we could use more labor organizing, but those, those are at least two examples of where that happens locally. And I'm sure it's very helpful. Yes? Yeah, no, I, I love your observation because, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to learn as much about uh, this population and, and risk as we can. So you're talking about um, their time orientation and if things aren't going right, if they're not making the money that they had hoped to make and supporting their families, you know, it's, it's harder to invest in the future. I, I, this is what I'm kind of hearing you, hearing you say. And, uh, you know, it's harder to, why, why take good care of yourself if, if if the future is looking dim and things aren't going right, and that and that's what we think happens. This is this is a, a recipe in some ways for uh, any num any number of risk uh, uh, problems that could that could happen in this group. And as I say, there's uh, so many so many layers of uh, of factors that contribute to that. But that that's uh, thank you for that observation. I, I think that does does come out in the scale. And again, we the way we put that scale together is asking people what that term, what what is what does desesperación mean to you? And so when they would talk about it, then we would come back as a team and try to craft these uh, these items, which, as you say, seem to capture some some dimension of temporality in their in their lives. Yes. So how did we get some of the agencies on board uh, to work with us? Well, you know, it, it, it helps to, uh, to have uh, worked in the community and to, and to know people. I did my uh, uh, internship uh, quite a bit at SF General. In fact, one of my supervisors is sitting here, Ricardo Munoz. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time getting to know different people and, and organizations, building up some trust. The other thing, too, is if you're lucky enough to get uh, a large uh, R01 grant, you know, a couple million dollars for, you know, five years to do your dream study, you've got to share that with the community. You know, you've got to sit down with your community partners. They're always strapped for funds. They're always doing so much with so little. So we would sit down and talk to them and say, what, what, what do you need? You know, what would, what would make you uh, invested? They were certainly invested with the idea of, of, of learning more about these men and helping these men. But uh, you know, we, we were we were good at uh, sharing our grant funds 
with uh, four different, four or five different uh, community-based agencies that are already serving day laborers, already committed to that population. So it wasn't, it wasn't too hard. And we also made a point to uh, interview and talk to them, you know, about what, what they knew about this population. So they felt like they were contributing. Uh, in fact, one one agency said, "Why don't you put a day laborer on your team, on your research team?" You know, we, and we said, "Okay." Uh, got any suggestions? So they recommended somebody that we'll call Jose, who actually hung out with our team for a number of years in, in our meetings and when he would take notes. And he was extremely helpful when we say, well, how do you say this? Or, you know, what does desesperación mean to you? And it was a brilliant idea that happened through that, being open to that collaboration. Yes, Dr. Munoz. One of the things uh, that I gave from your I'm in supervision again. <laughs> so uh, Ricardo's asking a number of things. He's, he's mentioning that uh, you know we're trying to uh, measure uh, certain constructs there and to, to be useful about that. But he's also asking about you know as health professionals, you know why why don't we ask about the context of, of people's lives? Uh, what I would say in response to that was uh, we did two things in this study. We we spent a couple of years doing deep ethnography, doing qualitative research, observing people, talking to people, doing in-depth interviews. And we published uh, quite a few articles about their structural vulnerability to drinking or risky sex uh, or both. And we believe that that's you know, a very legitimate contribution you know, to scholarship, to the, the, the literature. But then, you know, uh, you know, these days, uh, it's all about mixed methods research, right? If you can do qualitative work that informs quantitative work, that in turn informs qualitative work, I think, I think we, can, we can learn more that way. So it wasn't that we were just trying to, uh, you know, create these, you know, measurable scales. We, we, we also wanted to do the, the qualitative work and learn from that. Uh, but then we did want to follow up and do a, a survey from which we could uh, test some of these scales and validate uh, some of those scales. So, uh, so we did both is what, what I would say. You know, you're focusing on one part, which is absolutely true, but we tried uh, to do both in a related way. But to get to the second part about your question about why, why don't we ask about uh, the context of people's lives, well, you know what? That's, People are doing that. Health professionals in integrated behavioral health care. If you go to La Clinica de la Raza, 
in Oakland, which is the biggest provider of health services in the East Bay. They have about 30 offices. They do something called an ethnographic interview. So when people come in with health problems, they not only, they not only screen them for any number of psychosocial uh, and health problems, everything from domestic violence to psychosis to alcohol use and, of course, health problems. They also they, they do ethnographic interviews now where they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm seeing something that I call depression, but why don't you tell me what, what you think this is and what you think causes that and what have you tried, you know, to, to do to mitigate that and uh, what else do you think, you know, we should try. So some, so some of that is happening, regardless, particularly in integrated behavioral health care, which is community-based by design and, is, uh, and does a tremendous amount of outreach into the community to educate people and to bring them in, and then to listen to them just, just a little bit more than we're uh, used to doing. So, so I, think, I think some of that is, is happening and, and certainly needs to happen. I, I don't know that it would take that much extra time. Yes? Did I tell you he was my supervisor back in the day? Exactly. So the question is something like, is, is death espadacion just, just a Latino thing, or it, might it be generalizable to other? That, that's a good research question. I mean, we could definitely take that scale, right, or versions of it and try that out with different populations. What I can tell you as a Latino myself, it's a term that I always heard growing up. It was always used in the community, you know. And so it was, it was uh, exciting in a way to hear it come up so often for this population and to try to measure it in their predicament. But in, in answer to your question, uh, I would say, yeah, it's definitely a very popular Latino idiom of distress. But, uh, you know, it, if, if we are uh, more alike than different, there could indeed be versions of that in, in, uh, in other populations. Uh huh. Ah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, but I, I would assume there has to be uh, overlap with demoralization, uh, this desperation and demoralization, because these are these are men who feel demoralized. These are men who culturally feel like they're making huge sacrifices for their families, and it's their job to support those families, and they're they're having a very very difficult time doing so. So yeah, why why wouldn't there be demoralization uh, in that in that picture? That's a, that's a great idea. Great idea. I'm going, to, I'm going to look for some of those scouts. Uh, let's take one last question uh, in the back there. No, actually, I was referring to just healthcare more in general. You know, where we, uh, you know, we we have caseloads that are extremely demanding. We have limited time, and, and very often we default, you know, to protocol and don't ask enough. But I think you're absolutely right. In, in, in mental health care, 
that's that's pretty that's pretty critical. <laughs> that's absolutely essential. Okay, I think I think we are at time. But thank you so much for uh, attending and for all the terrific comments and questions.